and the gospel are five. Matthew 5, 16. While you're turning, let me just quickly make uh, one announcement. Next Sunday, Kathy and I are going to be out of town. We're going to be visiting my father in Tucson, Arizona, my sister and my, my uh, uh, nephews and their families, and we're really looking forward to that. Antonio will be here preaching. Glenn will be leading worship. You're going to have an awesome time in the Lord, so invite your friends and, and come and be here next Sunday. And, of course, this Wednesday night is the Come to the Well from 7 to 8 o'clock, and it has been really special, the time of prayer and intercession. So come. We won't be here, but, but there are guys here that, that, uh, that uh, lead in prayer and uh, just know how to let the Spirit of God move, and they'll be here, and we'll have an awesome time. And Kathy and I will return on Tuesday. You know, of course, that you can get in touch with us because we're never far from the electronic leash called a cell phone. Not that I want any of you to use it, but I'm just saying, in case you need to. Hallelujah. Have you found Matthew chapter 5? Yes. All right. This is, um, this is a familiar verse to you, but I, I, I'd ask that you um, try to hear it as though you're hearing it for the first time. And listen to the, the words of Jesus and ask yourself, what might he be talking about? When you hear the word light, because the Lord's going to say something about his light in us and us being that light. When you hear the word light, I'd like you to think of the word function. Been sharing the four F's, fellowship, focus, function, and fruit. And, and last week we began to look at what it means to function in the body of Christ, to function as a Christian. So I want you to think of function when you hear light. And the reason why is we were designed to shine. That's why Isaiah said, Arise, shine, for your light has come. We should shine with the glory of God. If you just think about it from the Old to the New Testament, the Bible makes very clear that we were designed to be the candle of the Lord, to have His glory, to have His light. So that's our function. That's our function. When Jesus was functioning, He shined and healing shined from Him and miracles shined. And the, the, the shining of Jesus needs to shine through you and I. All right? So... Have that in mind. Here we go. This is Jesus in Matthew 5 and 16. Let your light, your function, so shine before men so that they can see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. As I said, I've been sharing about those four wonderful principles that form together in the Bible a way, the way, to walk with God, to know Him and to walk with Him. Fellowship, focus, function, and fruit. They're consecutive. They are interlocking. They work together. They never work apart. We begin with fellowship. And in fellowship, we receive God's focus in life. We're now at the point where we're talking about progressing on to uh, function. And then function will produce fruit. In the four Fs, there is an interlude between focus and function. Advancing from fellowship and focus forward into function and fruit is not an automatic progression. God has inserted an intentional rest after focus and before function. It's, um, it's really a, a cost-counting pause if you will, waiting for the desire and determination to invest the gains of your fellowship with God into the lives of others. It's a moment for you and I to stop and count the cost and make the decision. Do I want to go from just seeing things to doing things? Do I want to go from knowing to action? And there's a natural pause, and I think it was underscored, in the little prophetic exhortation that was given, I have reached as far as I can reach, you need to reach. There is a part for you and I, and this morning's message is going to be about us understanding that part. Because to go from focus into function in your life is a sacrificial decision. It's a decision of intense commitment and intentionality. Because it's the transition from living in a template, 
How many of you know what a template is? Let me see your hands if you understand. I think most people know what a template is. It's a, it's a form, like a box. And a cookie cutter is a template. And so that pause, that, that, that divine break, if you will, between focus and function is a transition from living in a template to functioning as the light of the world, as Jesus called us to be, to be the light of the world. The transition from living with a Christian focus to functioning as a Christian can threaten all of the securities of living in one of the world's templates. One of the great examples, for me anyway, one of my favorite in the Bible of a person who came to this point is actually found in the Old Testament um, hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus Christ ever came. So the person that I'm going to talk to you about never knew who the Messiah was, but certainly knew that a Messiah would come, that we would need God coming into the world and saving us. And that person is Rachel, the wife of Jacob. And uh, I'm not going to take a lot of time with Rachel this morning, but I just want to allude to the story of Rachel because I've preached about this a number of times and I've shared the story of Rachel. You can go to, uh, I think, Genesis chapter 30, read the first several verses, and in the next couple chapters you'll, you'll see about her life. The Bible writes a lot about Rachel. Rachel was the second wife of Jacob. Jacob labored for her um, with uh, uh, her father to be given her as a wife seven years and then was tricked and was given the older sister who was not as attractive and he wasn't in love with her, Leah. And um, when he realized he was tricked, he went back and made a deal with the father to work another seven years for Rachel. He wanted Rachel. So Rachel was, was highly favored. The Bible says she was exquisitely beautiful. And um, Rachel, the wife of Jacob, if anybody has led a highly favored life, Rachel led what we would call a highly favored life. She was highly favored by her husband. And uh, if you would, in your mind, you could just imagine, just kind of flesh it out in your thoughts. Um, he was a very wealthy man, so I'm sure that she wore the best clothes. She had all the jewelry and accoutrements and accessories. She probably never had to lift a finger, had servants waiting on her, ate whatever she wanted to eat. I mean, if you think about it, besides all of that, she had the adoration of her husband. The one thing she didn't have was she didn't have the ability to have children, which today might not be considered a big problem, but in her day, <laughs> it was the worst problem for a woman because in her day, the worth of women not in the eyes of men only, but in the eyes of women themselves, was the ability to have and to raise children. And the future, the posterity, if you will, of a woman and her virtues would live on in her children. So having children was everything to Rachel, but she was barren. Where her sister Leo just couldn't stop cranking out children. She just had one right after another. And every time she'd have another baby, she'd go to Rachel and kind of wiggle it in her face and say, mm -hmm. <laughs> Jacob didn't care much for Leah, but he was crazy about Rachel. Rachel began to become depressed. As the years went on, she became completely dissatisfied with her advantages in life. None of her advantages could console her. She was inconsolable with all the prosperity and benefits that she had in life. So even though she was highly favored, the one thing she wanted, it seemed life had robbed her from. And what I want to say to you was that what Rachel yearned and cried out for was to function. She was no longer happy with her job, which was basically to be happy with all your advantages. Rachel had one job in life. You're beautiful, everyone loves you, you've got everything, everyone wants to be you, be happy. That's your only job, just be happy. I love you, her husband would say, just be happy. But she could not be happy. 
She could not be happy because living to be happy, living to absorb all the benefits in life, to acquire what everyone else wants, was not fulfilling her. She wanted to function. She wanted to live the sacrificial life of a mother. And how many moms here, it's a, it, I'm, I apologize that Kathy and I are going to miss Mother's Day um, with you celebrating Mother's Day, but how many mothers this morning would say, motherhood is a sacrificial life? And just because they grow up, the sacrificing doesn't stop, does it? Nobody understands that but a mother. So Rachel got to the point where she couldn't live for anything but the ability to function. Her life came down to that. And so in Genesis chapter 30, verse 1, is that famous scripture where it says, Rachel saw that she bore Jacob no children, She became jealous of her sister and said to Jacob, give me children or else I die. Wow, that's pretty dramatic. I see no purpose in living if I cannot function. Now, every person who is brought by spiritual rebirth into the family of Christ shares the calling to reproduce, nurture, and mentor spiritual children and expand that family that they've been brought into. Rachel's cry for God-given, fruit-bearing function stirs restlessly within our spirits this morning. It's a native function of the born-again heart. It's just natural. When people, one of the things you can tell when you've been born again is there's that natural cry that starts to emerge from within you to want to go out and duplicate yourself to want to go out and let the life that's in you come into other people, to share Jesus with others. In other words, Rachel's cry, give me children or else I die. Haven't you ever uh, been in church and just wanted to scream out, but thank God you didn't, um, (laughs) scream out and say, I can't take it anymore. I don't know what it is, this restlessness. We usually misdiagnose what that restlessness is. But in one way or another, it's often sponsored by the deep, deep urge to bear fruit spiritually. We want spiritual children. We want ourselves to go. I always appreciate when I see other people leading people to Christ or bearing fruit in their life. But what it really does for me while it excites or stirs me up is it makes me want to bear fruit in my own life. And every believer has this inescapable urge to want to bear fruit, to function in the capacity that John in John chapter 15, that Jesus, excuse me, in John chapter 15 told his disciples when he said, you did not choose me, but I chose you and I appointed you so that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide. So when you're born again, that calling to bear fruit is naturally bred into the new birth inside of you. And you can't escape it. You can quench it. You can deny it. You can try to redirect it into other activities in your life. But you'll never reach satisfaction by any of those other activities or recreations or religious activities even until you connect with actual fruit bearing in your life because that's that's the inbred desire you want to function you want your life to be a function you will never be satisfied falling into one of the world's templates and living your life out God has called us out of those templates and to be the light of the world most try to find contentment with merely living a good life If I can live a good life, I've done my thing for God. That's as much as anybody can hope for. But the the, the, the deeper urge to produce fruit is very unsettling and pushing our hearts upwards into function. The life of Christ cries out from within us to reinvest itself in the lives of others. 
So here's the question that I'd like to pose this morning, and I'd like us to, quite frankly, I'd like us to wrestle with this question a little bit. And the question is this. Why should we flee the familiarity of life's templates if I get married and have a family, if I go to school and I have a decent career, if I become a productive member of society, if I join a church and do my part, all of these templates of, in life, if I reach out to attain goals, if I work to attain power and use that power to make the world a better place, these are all templates that you hear alluded to at high school graduations and college uh, uh, graduation ceremonies. And, and some of you are probably going to go to some of these graduation ceremonies in the next week or two. And you're going to hear these things. And young people with their eyes filled with the hope of these templates, they have bought into the idea of life's templates. And they are ready to invest their lives Yet another generation that's going to march blindly down into the hole of life's promising templates and allow those templates to just eat up their life. And before it's all over with, at some point they'll realize this never turned out the way I had hoped it was going to. So let me conclude the question. Why should we flee the familiarity of life's template? just to face the sacrifices of Jesus' call to be the lights of the world. Because if you're going to be the light of the world, you're going to have to take up your cross and follow him, deny yourself. The first thing that's going to happen is the walls of that template that you have entered into are no longer going to be satisfying to you. And following Jesus may mean you have to break out of those walls. At the very least, you're going to have to bring Christ into that template with you. And he has a way of messing up a house. I was reading in my, uh, I was in my Bible reading this morning. And yes, I do Bible reading even on Sunday morning when it doesn't have anything to do with my message because we need the word every day. So I got up a little early and I, I opened uh, to where my reading had brought me the day before. And wouldn't you know it, I came to the place in uh, Luke's gospel where Jesus had entered the house and um, the, the place was thronged with people, as usual, and they tore the roof open to get a lame man down to Jesus. And the Bible says, Jesus, seeing their faith, said, be healed. As I read that story, um, I read where it said that the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And we get excited when we read that testimony. But when I read it this morning, I thought about the poor guy that owned the house. Have you ever thought about those things when you read the Bible? You think of the, the back story or what's going on in the background. I thought, I tore the guy's roof up. If my roof was tore up, you know, I would hope insurance would cover it. But if they said, you know, you had that prayer meeting, you let those people tear your roof up, this is on you, Mr. Champlin. We're not going to be paying for your roof. So, you know, I was kind of focused on that, and I thought, you know, Jesus is dangerous. He is. I mean, he, you let him in, he's going to mess up what you've worked hard for yourself to create. Because, believe it or not, he thinks what he's doing is more important than your template. He does think that. And I've got to warn you, people rush sometimes to the altar. Jesus, come into my life. Because in their mind they're thinking, I want relief from the burden of sin. I want relief from the, the unhappiness in my heart. I want relief from the emptiness I've got cancer, Jesus can heal me, whatever it is. And those are not bad reasons to get saved. Those are the things that drive people to the Lord, their need, their brokenness. But we do come to Christ as consumers. And Jesus is cool with that. He understands that, you know. That's why when Jesus first went back to Nazareth and then to Capernaum and then started making the circuit around Galilee, that's why what he did was he just started healing people so that, they would see that God was there in, in him, and it drew people. However, the thing is that when you really receive him, he, he messes things up. He will disturb and, and upset your life because he believes that being the light of the world and 
sharing that light with others is more important than anything else you're pursuing in your life. So having said that, the question is, why should you and I, as Christians in the 21st century, leave the comforts of the template to go be the light of the world? Whatever that means in your life, it is going to mean a change. Why should you do it? And really think about that. Why? When you could be a Christian and still go to heaven, you don't have to leave the template. You don't have to really sacrifice yourself to be the light of Christ. You don't have to ask that hard question in prayer. Lord, what do you require of me? God will let you do your own thing and stay saved and you'll go to be with him in heaven. He will permit it. He'll allow it. I'm not going to lie to you this morning because you can do that. He saves you by grace through faith. It's not by works. So why should you take that extra step and go from focus? Why should you go from being a focusing Christian to a functioning Christian? When it could cost you everything, could disturb all your plans. The simple answer to that question is eternity. The light of the world is an eternal light. It's not just a temporal light. Those who live to function as the light of the world, they are sowing into eternity. The templates that we fall into only last, hopefully, for a lifetime. Most of the time, they don't even last a lifetime. How many people have begun their life in the pursuit of one thing only to have it fall apart out from underneath them and now they're scrambling around midstream in life trying to find some other thing to direct their life into. In fact, it happens a lot. So the reality is, is that the templates of life are temporary. But being the light of the world, you are working with eternal properties. You are sowing into eternity. Every act of obedience, every sacrifice, Every time you, you turn away, as Jesus did from doing his own will in the garden and say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You are sowing into your crown in eternity. Amen. You are sowing into what your life will be forever. I don't have time this morning to talk about eternity in a, in a technical sense, but this much I do know from studying the Bible about eternity. The Bible doesn't really show us a whole lot, but enough to let us know that eternity is going to have at least as much purpose as life does now, just without the curse, just without the futility, just without the misery. But the God of purpose is not going to stop and all of a sudden once we go and be with him in eternity, there will be no purpose. There will just be endless bliss. Endless bliss, most of us have the attention span of a, of a cockroach, pardon me. But the reality is, endless bliss will last about a week with most of you in heaven. So just lounging by your pool in your mansion, you're going to get bored fast if that's all that it is. So whatever eternity is, there is purpose. And Jesus made that clear in his parables that there's going to be rewards, there's going to be levels, there's going to be jobs, there's going to be a whole universe to reign and rule over. So I don't know how accurate the science fiction prognosticators have been, but I do know that whatever the universe holds, the capital of the universe is going to be the earth and we are going to rule and reign with him. And purpose is definitely going to be our most important interest. So sowing for eternity should be the most important thing in a Christian's life, is to live with your eyes on eternity. In 2 Corinthians 4 and 18, Paul writes, We look not at the things that are seen, but of the things that are unseen. I want you to stop for a moment. This week, how much of your vision was taken up with the things that are seen? I don't say that 
with any condemnation in mind. But was that because there was nothing unseen for you to look at? Was that because there was nothing that God ever wanted to show you that is invisible? That there was no activity going on in the heavenly places or in the spirit realm? We tend to give 90% or more of our attention, our thought life, to what is seen. We serve the tyranny of urgencies. And we do so because they're urgent and because they present themselves. Are we being robbed of the assignments God could be giving us? And so the person who goes from focus to function finds that that there is that pause where you have to stop and consider. You have to be still and know that he's God. You have to look up and realize there's more than what's going on around me. And say, Father, I, I want to be a functioning life. I want my life to function. I want to serve you. I want to be the light of the world. And so Paul writes, We look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient or temporal, passing away. But the things that are unseen are eternal. They are deathless, as the Amplified Bible says. So the templates of this world are mere, if eternity is the never-ending flame of God's light, of glory, then the templates of the world are merely flickering sparks. They flash a promise, but then quickly fade out. Think of all the templates into which generations have poured their lives. Family, prosperity, education, power. Those pursuits are noble, and they're typical, and probably the four that top the list in any culture around the world of the templates that lives pour themselves into. Consider them. Family, prosperity, education, power. In the world, the safety of family and community is broken up by the infidelity and selfishness of sin. Never lasts. How many divorced couples do you know? No hands need to go up, but how many people have been through a divorce? Either your parents or you yourself or your children. There's not very many people today that are not touched by infidelity. No matter how fabulous and wonderful and powerful marriage is, the two shall be one. What God's put together, let not, let not man tear apart. And yet we live in a world where all of those promising hopes and aspirations that marched up the altar... To take those vows before God, probably 80, 90 percent, have been touched in one way or another by the infidelity, the inability of us in those templates to maintain the promise. And those flickering sparks, they go dark, they go out. And not just family, not just marriage, but whole communities, towns, communities, whole nations and empires that began with promise end up in darkness. And on the trash heap of history, there's empire after empire, nation after nation that are thrown on there, failed nations that rose and then fell in decline. Family, the family template is a flickering spark. The pursuit of prosperity never really brings security. We hear of people becoming Wealthy to the extent that they've got more money than they could ever burn through in a lifetime and as lost as they can be. Insecure, on pills, medication, seeing doctors, committing suicide. The acquisition of prosperity does not bring security. It's not eternal. The investment of education. We put a premium on it. so important. We shove, we push our children into education. I'm not saying that these templates should not be pursued. I'm not saying that we should not engage with them in life. But if you are investing yourself, the lives of your children, or advising others to simply put yourself into one of these templates and then trust God to keep you in it, 
You are lying to yourself and you're lying to other people. Jesus didn't call you to do that. He called you to be the light of the world. The most important thing you can say to yourself and the most important thing you can say to your children and to one another is you need to come out of the darkness and into the light. And however you say that or demonstrate it through your actions, it is the most important thing because it's the only thing that offers true lasting security. So the investment of education, what's wrong with it? Well, it never leads to truth. And that's probably never been truer in the history of our nation anyway than it is today. Our universities and colleges are taking more money than they've ever taken and producing less with it. They've become institutions of delusion. The truth doesn't come out of education. Too often today, education drives people farther from the truth, hardens them from the truth. Why are we pushing our children further and further and deeper and deeper into education that's hardening them? I see Jesse nodding his head. Jesse's got five children. I know that he's thought about this. And I know, of course, the Trimbles have made an investment to assure that their precious children are not fed into that template that simply destroys lives. There's nothing wrong with education. I'm not suggesting your kids become a bunch of trailer-dwelling dropouts. <laughs> but just so long as they believe in Jesus, what I'm saying is, if you're going to go from focus to function, you have to embrace the call that will make you a functioning Christian. That is to be the light of the world. Not just to run around and say, I believe in Jesus and have that kind of focus. The last one, the acquisition of power. What's wrong with the template of the acquisition of power? Well, I, th I think most of you can figure that one out. It's pretty simple. It only lasts until someone with more power comes along and takes it away from you. It's a perpetual and continual king on the mountain battle in this life. You're up there until the next guy comes up and knocks you off the top. Power in this world does not produce security. But God, hallelujah, praise the Lord, but God. Thank God there's another side to this. Sounds dreary if you listen to me up to this point. You think, what in the world did I get out of bed to come here this, for this morning and hear this? This is the, you know, I know this. I'm trying to escape these facts. Well, sometimes you have to go through the tunnel in order to appreciate the light. But God, hallelujah, if you will be the one that is the light of the world, you're the one who gets to tell people that God's family is forever. Yeah, infidelity may have eaten the family that you had out from under you. But God's family is forever. Romans chapter 8, verse 38, And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears of today or our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. See, God's family is underwritten, protected by agape, and that is an eternal love that will never fade. We rest secure in God's forever family. Can you say amen? God's prosperity, but God's prosperity is forever. Hallelujah. Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said, don't accumulate for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in to steal. But accumulate for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break forth to steal. Boy, that in and of itself is enough for me to say, Lord, I'm going to be the light of the world. I want to invest in eternity. I may not get everything I want or need in this life but in eternity where it's really going to matter because I'm kind of counting on the fact that eternity is going to be a lot longer than the handful of years I'm going to be living in this life. So if, if there's one life or the other, one world or the other, where I don't want to get stuck in poverty, that's the one. Amen. Hallelujah. And so eternal life is rich with treasures, unlike those flickering templates that the world offers, that will never run out. 
Praise God. Can you say amen? But God's education, God's education is eternal truth and unchanging reality. Don't you just hate the fact that almost every month, maybe, maybe even every week, there's a new reality being reported on the news today. I don't even want to go into the commentaries. You all are bobbing your heads. You know exactly what I'm talking about. But the world is turning itself inside out, upside down, rewriting the very laws of the universe, the very perspective of reality. Thank God that what is real will eternally be real amen. in the presence amen. of God. Can you say amen? For Jesus said, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words Hallelujah. shall never pass away. So I want to invest in eternity. I don't want to live a delusional life. I don't want to put myself in partnership with a reality that's always changing and shifting based on the moods of other people or even my own moods. But I am fairly certain and secure in the confidence that Whatever time or energy I put into being the light of the world, I'm investing in a reality that will never fade or change. Finally, God's power. God's power is an eternal power. It is deathless. And I found a verse, um, you may or may not be familiar with it, out of Hebrews. It talks about how Jesus um, sits in the office of the high priest of our salvation and it describes the power that put him in that position. Listen to this. Because it's the power that you will put your life in and invest your life in when you go from focus to living a functioning life as the light of the world. Jesus holds his office not in obedience to any temporal law, but by the power of an indestructible life. Jesus is high priest forever because nobody can knock him out of that position. He is in that position by the power of an indestructible life. It's not a regulation that makes Jesus the high priest. It is the fact that he kicked the teeth out of death. It's the fact that he turned hell inside out. It's the fact that he spit death out and rose up with a life that taunts darkness, that taunts the lies, that taunts the enemy and says, if you can take your best shot, take it. See what you can do with this. In other words, I am the high priest of you, 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 your life, your profession, because power has put me here. It is the power of an indestructible life. And I know that no matter how weak you and I are, here in this life, in this fragile life, when we take that life and invest it and live it as the lights of Christ, the witnesses of Christ, and we go forth in weakness, it is the power of that life that cannot be unseated or undermined that works through our weakness. That's what you're investing in. And you will never be disappointed. Even when disappointing things come in life, Everyone around you is going to be falling apart, pulling their hair out. Oh, my God, the stock market. I lost all of my retirement. Uh, oh, the company that uh, hires everybody in this community just pulled the plug and went under. We're all out of work. What are we going to do? And everybody is in a general state of collective depression. And there you are, you know, not wanting to be the oddball, but you can't wipe the silly grin off your face. Because somewhere deep inside, you haven't been living for those things. You've been living to be the light of the world. And what you see is an opportunity to share good news with people who are eating nothing but bad news. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. You know, well, there, when the world is sinking, you're rising. That's the functioning life. The law of the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. So, I know that you are living incognito in this life and simply camouflaging the light of Christ in the templates that you are living in. But deep down inside, you know 
You are his witness. You are his fire ready to catch. You are his power ready to blow up. You are his, his appearance ready to blow onto the scene in somebody's life. Living with that forward, deliberate will to enter in to being a functioning witness for Christ. Hallelujah. And um, so our altar call is very simple this morning. Today, decide to upgrade your life. It's very easy. Just take the pause between focus and function to unsettle your own heart with Rachel's cry. Take a moment just to let Rachel's cry rise up within you. Don't push it away. Let it push your heart up into functioning as the light of the world and invest yourself into eternal life in Christ. So if you would close your Bible and stand with me. We're going to pray. And our focus, our objective this morning is going to be simple. I know that, that God has different assignments for all of us and nobody can tell you what your assignment is nobody can from day to day tell you what way are you to be a shining light but God will tell you in your own heart in your own life God will tell you and you won't have to be uh, nervous or insecure that if you're not being like somebody else or so and so or doing what they're doing Deep within yourself will be that wonderful confidence, I'm doing what God has given me to do. And I'll tell you, that peace will keep you through the storm. And so I'd like you just to pray that. God wants to give you that. God wants you to have that. If you have that in your life, good, let's just refine it and focus on it. But if you're here this morning, you say, you know, I have had that unsettled thing in my life. And it will happen throughout your life. It's not a one-time shot. We're constantly re-navigating, making adjustments as we go through life. We revisit Rachel's cry over and over and over again in our life. So you may be at that cycle right now where that cry is crying out in you and you're, you're realizing this morning that some of the things you've been struggling with in the past weeks or months perhaps or maybe even year or more, um, underneath it, is really the need to resolve to be the light of the world, to be the witness of Christ, to live that deliberate, intentional life for Jesus. And I believe this morning can be that time to just make that decision and say, Lord, just bring me, bring me into it. I want to have that functioning life. And God will do the rest. Heavenly Father, we come before your throne with a grateful heart. We thank you for the Holy Spirit that we don't have to figure this out by ourselves. But I believe you are speaking throughout this church this morning. You are speaking to every heart and every mind. And only we in our hearts know what you are saying, but we hear you. And for those that are hearing you, I pray, give us the courage to truly open the door and say, here I am. Do what needs to be done to make me a functioning witness a functioning life for Christ. Father, I pray that if we need to lay the template on the altar, if we need to do that to make the claims of your kingdom more prominent, to put them in first place, help us, give us the courage to do that right now. I pray in Jesus' mighty name. And Father,